Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 504, featuring an interview with Oleg and Artem of Snag. That's S-N-E-G. Now that's a company that's been bringing back some of my favorite games of all time, including the great Gold Box series, Pool of Radiance, Curse of the Azure, Bonds, etc. As well as the Black Box games, uh, Eye of the Beholder uh, series, uh, and many, many other great, and some even, <laughs> frankly, not so great uh, titles from SSI and many other companies. Uh, that we grew up with in the 80s and 90s. Uh, now the great thing about Snag is they're making these games easy uh, for people like me, but also for people who are new to these series. It's just a matter of going to GOG or Steam and download the thing, <laughs> install it, and you know, you're off to the races. Uh, whereas before these guys came along, it can be quite tricky uh, to get these things uh, up and running. Uh, and even if you were, the legality of that, frankly, was... <laughs> often questionable at best, as I'm just really happy that these guys are doing this work. And I wanted to get them on, you know, figure out who these guys are, why they're doing this, what are their plans for the future, and much, much more. And I had a really good chat, and I think you really are going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Oleg and Artem. Hi, guys. I am here today with Oleg and Artem of Sneg, a company doing the Lord's work and <laughs> uh, some of the a lot of the games I actually cover here in this fabulous book here dungeon of desktop the gold box games pool of radiance curse of the azure bonds i mean just if you watch this channel you know those games and also of course the black box uh classics i think you guys are big fans of this series as i was reading some oh of your i'm episodes. it's my personal favorite one so yes <laughs> of course a uh, blade of darkness you know there's a lot of these games that uh really until you know, you guys came along and doing this book in the first edition, especially. I remember how hard it was to find these games and, and to get them to uh, uh, to work at all. You know, on the PC, all the emulators and the uh, trying to figure out uh, even like getting the mouse to work. <laughs> it's just real basic stuff with such a pain. Uh, not to mention the. Uh, you, know, you could even get viruses and things going to some of the places where you had to, you know, download. The things yeah. we do to play the games a lot. Yeah. We're getting viruses on our computers. Yeah. I mean, what a nightmare. And you guys have made it so easy. You know, and it's great to me to think about people that, you know, read about games in a book like this and they want to play them. And thanks to you guys, they can do that really as easily as they could, you know, completely a new game, if not. More so. So anyway, just want to start just by saying thank you, guys. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, we need to thank community. This is like part of our DNA because I believe without gamers, without people who love these fantastic uh, titles uh, that have this certain nostalgic feel, um, we will not be able to do this. So it's always cool that somebody's supporting you on another side of the monitor. I love to hear more about the show. What got you guys motivated to do this work? How you got started with it? You know what what your story is basically. Artem, you want to start or should I start? I think we can start uh, going way back in terms of like where it all started, and I'll pick it up the moment we will get closer to the S and E G the snake thing. Sure, I'll, I'll probably start from my background again. I was playing video games since I remember myself. Um, again, I was born in Russia. In Moscow so we didn't have quite a few consoles there so we had very interesting uh emulators uh coming from China generally uh but again still remember playing with my uh, father on something that was called Sinclair back to the time yeah uh so you might guess what it was um and then slowly slowly playing when it became my hobby uh then I went to first internet cafes in Russia, you're still trying to understand what Sinclair is, right? Mm -hmm. well, that's a good that's a good task for Matt. I'm sure he will find an answer super fast. You're talking about the spectrum? Exactly. Oh, so you're emulating these games on. I didn't even know they had these on. Um so yes, that's how it all started. And then again, school internet cafes, 
uh, started spending days and nights there uh, playing uh, first Quake, then uh, Half Life, then Counter Strike, and th and then I got stuck on Counter Strike for many many years. Yeah, I can so myself, I can call myself a pro gamer. Uh, and when I was a, I cannot say kids. Uh, it was like my first years. I think at the university, um, I've uh, established a team with a few friends of mine that was called Virtus Pro. Uh, so if there are some Counter-Strike players, they might heard about it, uh, at least about second uh, reincarnation of this team. Uh, and that, that was actually the way for me to enter a games industry, because I was also uh, a referee on some uh, esports tournaments at the time, Generic Quake 3, uh, Warcraft, Starcraft, and Counter-Strike as well. And I was invited by one game developer uh to be a referee in one of the uh tournaments in the game that wasn't released at that time and that was an entry ticket uh, and since the time worked as a producer uh as international licensing manager business development manager um sales manager um, and many 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 other roles uh, but what is most important it led me towards cd project guys uh in 2008 um when they proposed me to um open a russian representation of their studio and to, to take care of distribution and publishing of the games there uh, so i came for three months trial periods uh in poland to get to know people the board hmm. and it was the moment when the crisis kicked in uh financial crisis in europe and generally global one so instead of uh, opening offices, we was trying to survive at that time. And at the same time, there was uh, the idea of good old games born. Um, and um, I joined its team um, as probably the first uh, official business development person who was looking for all these old rights, uh, finding the rights holders uh, of these games, trying to get license from them trying to get the rights for certain work that was done by community. And that's when it started. So since 2008 till 2021, I'm lost already. Uh, I was a good old games guy. Um, so yes, it's a long part of my history. So majority of the games that appeared on GOG.com within the first seven years, um, I think I've signed all these deals negotiated them and afterwards uh, that's the moment when Artem joins the story um, he was also uh, on the game developer game development side and once we were having a chat uh, of what he actually likes and he made a fantastic uh, story presentation about his life about his um, beloved games and uh, immediately got an invitation from me and from Marcin Vinsky, who was the CEO of the company back to that time. Um, and we hired this gentleman immediately. Seemed like it was a smart move. What do you think, Artem? They make like, the Oleg lured me into Warsaw, like, hey, come around, let's uh, let's meet. And I was just traveling nearby, and then boom, come to the office, boom, talk about this and this, and like, okay. I had to prepare. I had to come up with a presentation. It worked well. Yeah, so I can't complain. Uh, it was a wonderful time to be part of GOG for so many years. So you see that kind of where the whole enjoyment uh, of working in the classics kind of forced or showed in both of us. My background also uh, goes back to uh, from Moscow, Russia, where I was born, raised, and uh, I also had a massive love for gaming. I always wanted to work in games, but there was not so many opportunities. So I just applied for all internship positions I could come across. And I was like, you are doing a bad job in terms of marketing, I said in one of the emails. And one of the studio owners said like, oh, really? Come on, let's let's have a chat. Let's talk. And I got my internships. That's how I got into the industry. So uh, I also took on complaint. Um, and uh, also worked in marketing. I was creating trailers for games, localizing trailers for a long time, and then dealing with the websites. I had to, to launch one of the uh, digital storefronts uh, for one of the Russian publishers. And then once in a while, I met Oleg, 
And here I am working in GOG for, here I was working in GOG for so many years. And so after many years at GOG, um, there was a, a funny story where uh, actually my wife, uh, she was observing everything was happening at home, me talking about classic games, all it talking about classic games. And then COVID came in and she was on maternity leave and she's also works in gaming. She's importing uh, toy services and all that. It feels like I'm going to entertain myself by uh, reviving some of the classic games. And so she found one of the developers that happened to be a developer of a game called Diggles, a Mr. of Fenris, known as Wiggles. She managed to fix the game, sign the game. And as that was happening in terms of releases, I guess all of you started to kind of help her. In yes, yes that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's and I was moment. like, observe this. Uh, looking at this, like, I also want to do this thing. And so uh, after some time, Oleg and I both jumped on board and she was already like, ah, you know, I'm done with this cute, nice experiment. I want to do something else. So we, Oleg and I just proceeded, uh, proceeded uh, working on the snack and then became the thing we, we were trying to build and we're trying to bring as many classic games and great games as we want to because we have a huge huge wish list of things we adore and would like to revive it's kind of no, and probably there are like a few things that I, I need to say because while working in a big company because GOG became a huge company it was like over yeah. 180 people uh, at the top maybe even more I want to say close to 200 maybe um, and I realized that, hey, for many years, I'm not even touching anything linked to old games with my actual passion. And I remember the first years there when I was actually digging through internet, through web machines, time machines, trying to find certain um, connections between people who was working where, talking, chatting, uh, and finding these rights and these gold gems of the past and it was a fantastic experience, and I was actually super happy to get back to it. And I think Artyom, uh, looking at how it all, is, is how it's all working and how many dreams we still had at the time, also jumped on board happily. Yeah, totally. Um, big companies, uh, big problems, big issues, big projects. It becomes about numbers. There's a lot of things which you need to take uh, care of. It's not necessarily just games, even though it's a core of the business, right? Um, and it's very easy to lose track of things which you love the most. And at some point you look around and like, okay, my 90% of my life is big business deals. They have nothing to do with looking for the classic games. And it becomes a point where you're like, maybe I should change something in my life because I really like this title and this title, and there's no reason they're not available to people. And you know how you can approach this and you have this itching feeling that you should do it. So yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to go back to the roots where you look for the very specific games you know are great and they are lost either for stupid or no reason. And you know that you can contribute and make things right by a particular game. Yeah, I can't, can't tell you how many times I've even had the develop the, the guy, you know, <laughs> back in the day might be one dude doing the whole game, right? <laughs> and so I'd find like the guy that made the game, that did all, everything, and he's like, yeah, I don't know who has the rights to this. I don't have the rights to this. You know, it was uh, got sold to this big comp company and it went over here and then over there. And, you know, it might even be in a, what is that story about? That one of them ended up in like an insurance firm. <laughs> had like nothing to do at all with <laughs> No, no, no. That's, sorry, that's the story of system shock. Yes. Uh, yeah, the system uh, shock story I was reading. I mean, it's just, just fabulous. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it was a fun part because, um, again, we also at a certain point found uh, um, that insurance company owns the rights uh, for System Shock. And we contacted them, uh, I think, one or two years prior to Steven contacting them. And they sell, uh, sent us to hell saying, hey, we're not interested in even in talking. Uh, and then I remember Steven dropping in me an email to GOG, like to the general inquiries email address, saying, hey, guys, I have the rights. And I remember uh, our guys are forwarding it to me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, either it's a joke or somebody is lucky and was at the right moment with the right idea, with the right pitch, uh, had a really good discussion with the guys on another side and managed to acquire it. It was fantastic. And yes, since the time, we're having fun with Steven. 
and he is doing a great job. Yeah, yeah. Oliver mentioned the important thing: right question, right person, right moment. Because when you think about the big companies, like being gaming or not, um, it's very hard to get attention when it comes to the old IPs and old games because they are all about the this immediate big shiny things they're developing or about to publish, and so it's all about finding people who has the same love for a particular game and being able to to talk to them, to find allies in the organization, and then slowly over time, maybe uh, forge some deals so you can really release the game. Um, and it takes years. Sometimes, uh, like in the game in the background you have, well, it took, we started looking for this game, I think back at the GOG days for many, many, many years before it was like there's some publishing agreement with Codemasters that was released on GOG, that was taken off from GOG. So it's been a long journey to figure out what happened actually with the raid. And it's unfortunately the case for, say, uh, say it again? 2013, I think that's the first approach to this specific game. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's the case for many, many games. I don't, I don't know if I, I need to do cover this game on the show at some point. I know this is one of your favorite games of all time, right? The Blade of Darkness. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, the... apparently, this kind of spawned the whole Soulsborne genre. Artyom, the, flo the floor is yours, Artyom. I'm just shutting up. <laughs> well, first time I came across this game, as uh, Oleg mentioned, there has been just computer club game, computer clubs uh, in Moscow, in Russia back in the day. And so that's where I first saw this game because it was pretty demanding in terms of resources and my computer couldn't run it. And guys back then, because majority of the people who were playing games back then were guys, uh, they were either playing Counter Strike or this. Uh, and did, it's you know, been, when, you know when this game came out originally? 2001. 2001. Okay, so yeah, right around. So um, it's been pretty demanding game. That's how I kind of learned about it, played and learned, loved it since then. Um, and, you know, actually, yes, it was released before Dark Souls, but it's hard to say that it's kind of a game which defines the genre. It's just one of the cornerstones and important pieces which help to shape this thing. Um, because we know that there is Dark Souls games, there is other avenues which the Souls-like games uh, when developing. It's, we can say it's a precursor uh, of the genre. And so it's been very important um, reference for majority for a lot of people when they talk about uh, Souls games. But funny, funny enough, you can't play it <laughs> since 2014. Uh, and even before, it was not available because the game was not commercially successful. As the Codemasters released the game, um, there was no follow up. The game studio which created it uh, it's just closed the doors because they didn't have enough money uh, out of the release. So that that was it. There were plans for Xbox release, the original one, but they never eventuated, but it was just no, not enough money. And so uh, Rebel, Rebel, uh, Act. Rebel Act, the game studio in Spain, which was behind it, just closed the doors and that was it. That was the end of it. Uh, Maybe so it was good for games industry because out of this uh, company, uh, there were three more companies formed that we all know nowadays. Yeah, one of them made Castlevania, one of those games. I don't actually remember the full title. But yeah. Don't, don't remember which one again. Uh, and another one was To Kill It Works. So yes. Right. Right. To Kill Works. So what else to add? Sorry, I, I got lost. There's just so many conflicting thoughts about this game because it's been really uh, a challenge for us for a couple of years. The point is, it's important for the Souls-like genre. It's not exactly follows the Dark Souls, but if you play one another, you can see that they were going in the same direction uh, that defined the formula, which uh, quite a few games tried to replicate today. And I guess it still holds up really well today. It surprisingly does, because it was, I think, maybe one of the first, or if not the first game, which had real-time shadows. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. <laughs> Not bad for 2000. Was it 2001? I think you said. Yeah. yeah, I was, you know, some of the games I've come across and I've wanted to play, and one that sticks in my mind is all, uh, the game Auto Auto Duel. If you're familiar with that old Apple II, it was a game based on, I think, Car Wars and Steve Jackson games. And the problem there is the Steve Jackson games, they don't want this game 
to be released. And they're like, it's it's old, it's buggy, it's crappy. You know, even though there's all this demand, I'm sure I could get on um, GOG.com, you know, that little section on the forums where they have the wish list, <laughs> like games yeah. we like to see on GOG, you know, I, lo- I love looking at that. Uh, so I just, you know, you guys would know, I mean, what's the, what's harder? Is it harder to get the the permissions and the, to get the license and you know, the rights and that sort of thing? Uh, or is it harder to try to get the games working you know, dealing with uh, setting up emulators. I think I even read somewhere where you guys had to do your own uh, DLLs for a couple of these things. I mean, so it's way beyond just, you know, it, it sounds like there's quite a bit of work that has to be done uh, on the programming side. Uh, we can share. Uh, um, and let's try to understand who believes in what. In my opinion, it's harder. To fi- in my opinion, it's harder to, f- to find the rights because again, sometimes you just cannot release the game because somebody didn't like it at the time, or somebody believes he needs to get millions of dollars for it, despite the fact the game is forgotten for uh, a few decades already. <laughs> and uh, I know a few persons like this who are sitting on the certain rights and they don't want to release it and they're telling, hey, I want uh, a million dollars. Uh, exactly, unless you pay us a million dollars, we'll do nothing. And you're like, come on, this IP is gathering dust. Somebody will register this trademark tomorrow and you will lose it forever. But again, there are some people like this. Um, saying that, um, it's also hard to uh, remaster and ensure that the game is working nowadays. Hmm. I think that if you already have the rights, you will do everything to ensure this game runs. And I think this is part of probably Artem's and my DNA that no matter what, if we have the game, we'll make it work. Uh, and uh, we found uh, a few alleys here. Uh, Artem will be able to tell more about those if he wants. Um, a few great dev studios around this planet that are actually specializing in this. And a few individuals uh, that are also just, they're just geeks. They're nerds like we are. Uh, they can spend one year reverse engineering something. Yeah, I would also agree with all like that. Uh, legal side is always more challenging because you don't know if you can't if you can't assemble the rights if you can complete the puzzle and be absolutely sure that uh, that you have all the rights because with all games sometimes there's a situation where you just simply have no idea if you have all the rights because some traces are lost and you hope for the best um, but when it comes to the software and the game code it's always a function of time because in the very worst case, you can either reverse engineer the whole thing. I mean, it could take you years, but you can do this or you can redevelop it using the new engine and you can also do this. So it's a matter of your dedication, how much you want that. Uh, But usually it's better because uh, there's either some version of the source code or there is a nearest neighbor if it's an engine which was used by another which was used in another game and you have source code in another engine so you can kind of think around with the assets and the builds so uh, then it becomes a quest like do you know someone who who has particular skill set which you need so for example we work with a studio called general arcade which just specializes in digging in the old stuff in particular partially because of us because at some point like 10 years ago we started to come to them and say hey can you fix this and they're like we don't know let's try and they tried it work like okay here's another case okay 10 years later we're still working with them um and they they did partial reverse engineering partial fixes for some of the games but sometimes you know that you shouldn't do this you shouldn't touch the game and the best thing you, sh- you can do is just take the old game wrap a dos box around it tailor the DOS box emulation for it, look for community work, which was done because community does the best work usually and license certain um, community features or patches or applications, nicely bundle this up and don't break anything. Just leave it in there because that's what people want. And you need to be very self-aware when it comes to each in particular game. Because in some cases, worth fixing, like in Blade of Darkness, there's quite a few things which were fixed and still needs to be fixed. Uh, but in some games, you just should, you shouldn't mess with it. Yes, and there are lots of great people. Like, again, we stumbled upon fantastic uh, guys on our way. So especially like from the uh, recent things, like Goldbox Companion, 
Uh, yeah, so, the gold backs companion. I'm sitting here trying to find this. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I love Jonas uh, because what he actually did uh, again, it's just fantastic work. Um, and again, it's lots of time and passion that he invested in it. And again, we were super happy to partner with him, to work together with him. He made quite a few just adjustments for us. Uh, got feedback. We got feedback from him, and then I see that he's already iterating further, and he's asking for. And What's that guy? Importantly, it's bugging me. He's the gold box uh, companion guy. You remember his name? Jonas. Jonas, yeah, of course. <sighs> having a brain fart. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was just. I remember. I mean, I love the gold box games. You know, I always thought it would be. Uh, you know, I played it a couple times, and I always think, well, maybe I. I kind of want the original Commodore sixty four experience. Uh, yes, I thought that way for a long time, but then after I tried this gold box, I played with this gold box companion for about about two minutes, and I, I said, "This is this is the way." <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm never going to go back to that. Not having this, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just amazing, and to think it was just basically a big labor of love. No, no, it's a fantastic thing that he have done. Utterly fantastic. And again, the, the interesting thing is that he, he he keeps on developing it. And again, I see that he keeps on adjusting. He keeps on addressing certain feedback that he's getting from, like really uh, individuals, like border cases. And he still tries to do everything to make it all work. And again, we were happy to partner with him, like really. Uh, not not mentioning that. This. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize that in many cases, when it comes to the classic games, it's always a labor of love. Somebody loves this game they developing some features or applications or tries to maintain it so when you think of releasing something like that you should do your research if you haven't played this game as when you were a kid and you just know that just something you we are releasing right now you just do the research and understand what is important what has to be absolutely in the game or what needs to be addressed how do you make sure that the community work taps into what you were releasing so that's kind of always in our mind because without that, it just doesn't worth it. And truth to be told, in many cases, the games would not be released without the community work. So we're mostly doing the like, let the legal monkeys fix it so we can let the people who love it play. I know you're talking about DOSBox a while ago. And, you know, I don't know how many probably days or weeks of my life I've spent fiddling with those settings. I mean, even if you have the game, it's there, you know, it, it runs basically, you know, it, it can be so tricky just to get the thing to run at a, at a good speed and like weird stuff breaks. And yeah, you know, I just wonder what you, what your guys' experience has been like trying to get some of these games to work. Like what did you run in? Like what, what's the sort of the biggest challenges you, you've had? Is there stuff like, Oh no, that there's this particular era or this, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, where is, the, yeah, where is the real challenge? Where do you need the real genius uh, to get uh, these games to work? I think we're, we're blessed that throughout these years we found lots of friends um, that think alike. Like those box, I agree with you. It's a tough job. Many people believe, hey, it's just a simple wrapper. You launch any game using it and it works. Uh, 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 and then uh, again, Really, I'm super happy to call him friends like Peter, who is like one of two original creators of DOSBox, who is working on all our DOSBox releases uh, and supports us. Uh, he will, I'm sure he would be so um, frustrated if somebody says, hey, it's nothing, but you just launch it. Because every time he's playing exactly as you said, with all the settings, he's checking what works, what doesn't, which speed should be where, uh, which ad additional settings he needs to uh, add what to remove, uh, which version of those box works because sometimes together with a new version they're introducing certain problems, uh, and it's a hard thing. Uh, and not all, all the things can be fixed um, by using those box because again, some games they just didn't think uh, that computers can be so fast. <laughs> Even back in the day, I mean, I'm old enough to remember just the pain that people would have. You'd have a 486 and. Oh, the, this this particular graphics card, or this this is not the right sound card. You know, so I knew people that would have they would hold on to their old computer, you know, because it's like this. They knew that would run this game, 
<laughs> it wouldn't work even even as both DOS machines, right? Uh, but there would be just a few subtle differences, and suddenly the game would not work at all. Absolutely, and that's the case. Like recently, when we were playing around with Fantasy Empires, also with Peter, uh, and we found actually that the game never thought that actually computers can be so powerful. So uh, theoretically, if you play on a powerful PC, it's just just impossible the game uh, to play the game because it's too fast. And we had to balance it. And then we were uh, scared to get community feedback that, oh my God, it doesn't work on this uh, software or hardware or on this one. But so far, it looks like we found a good balance, which is nice. I think people also don't, um, and not aware that in order for us to make sure that a particular build works, it's not just create the build, we also need to do a QA. So we have to run it across as many different configurations as possible and do rounds after rounds to make sure that this particular setup works on the majority of systems, types of hardware, as much as we can reach before it actually goes into the release. So DOSBox is an amazing tool, but you need to know how to use it. And hopefully you're one of the developers so can help us tinker with it and come up with the best possible version. And yes, I, I would really appreciate if everybody understands that actually we are QA in games, but it's impossible to make QA on all available on this planet uh, setups. It's just impossible. So there will be bugs. And we uh, we said about it, it's like uh, we bring our apologies, but that's the reality. What Share your feedback. I dear think one, you know, one thing that I'm glad you guys are doing this is because i can tell you both are really love these games and you play these games your gamers who it's not just oh i want to cash in on this old title you know because <laughs> i don't think somebody like that you know and I, i've talked to a few i'm sure you have you have too right they're they're just sort of in it for the business they're in it basically for the money they they don't really care about these games so they would never go to these lengths that you're talking about to make sure like this is the we've this is as good as it's going to get <laughs> instead of this is good enough right <laughs> oh no. this is good enough we don't care if it's got a bunch of bugs and you know we're just going to shovel that out there you know it's a, you know it's again i have to thank you guys uh, for doing oh. this work Thank you. And, and some people believe, again, like uh, Arthur believes I'm crazy sometimes because we release for the silver box titles right now. And I keep on ordering things like this from different <laughs> from different, <laughs> country, from, oh from different God, countries yeah, because awesome. that's a Spanish version of this game. Spanish. What do you think uh, about that Shadow Sorcerer game? I was a, it's kind of, I kind of, I remember I, I, I booted it up a few times trying to figure it out. You know, I've heard that it was uh, way more innovative than people give it credit for. It kind of gets lumped in with like Hills, or not a Hills Far. It was it Heroes of the Lance, I think? Heroes of the Lance, yes. And there's a couple of really not so good games, you know, depending on who you talk to. But really, that one's way different. And people should yeah. take another look at it. It's different. And I would really recommend revisiting them. And uh, surprisingly, I'm often talking to different game developers and I'm recommending them, hey, in order to be a good game designer and understand games, it's actually super cool if you play old games from 90s because there are so many cool ideas, game design ideas there because you were not able to make something super shiny. You had to innovate. You had to ensure that it's the gaming mechanics are interesting, uh, that they suck you in, in these worlds and you get stuck there. Um and, and it's really great. It's kind of a real time right. game. I guess you could pause this. It reminded me, it seems way ahead of its time in a lot of ways. I don't see the year that it came out originally there. When did this? Yeah. This was like late sometime in the 90s, right? Uh, 92, 93, something like that. It's a really curious. Well, the interesting thing that some uh again, if you look at certain screenshots, you'll be surprised that hey, you might think oh populous. Maybe I've seen it somewhere there. It kind of reminded me at first. I was, I was thinking like Realms of Arcania. You know, yes. See this. It reminds me to the bridge, to be honest. You know, some oh. of the interesting things about this. I like the idea that you can't die, or that you're when you die, your party is uh, 
sort of back in this caravan. You go pull some more people out. Yeah, just lots of things that seem very modern. The whole story of Dragonlance is actually fantastic. And uh, it's really great that you can follow your heroes um, through a few titles, through a few games. And it was great back to the time. Because usually you play the game and then you can forget about your characters. And I think Goldbox, these were the first games where you can continue and progress with them further and further and further. It's a mm -hmm. cool feature which turned into a messy problem when we were releasing them because we had to figure out how to migrate the, the progress from one game to another. And then we're like, okay, so the default systems on digital platforms, they do not support that. So we had to invent the launcher just for these games, which would take care of the process of migrating save files between the games. And it was fun. I still remember us drawing maps from which game saves go where. Yeah. You can move the saves here, but not there. It was cool. Great experience. It's really important for these games because, uh, you know, that's what a lot of people want to do. You want to create a character in pool. You get attached to those characters. You don't want to. It's an option. You could create a new party for Curse or for Secret, but it just never felt right to me. <laughs> you just kind of get a, a, attached somehow. I remember I was always bummed that I couldn't bring my uh, party from Silverblades into, what oh, was it, Pools of Darkness, I think was the, the last game. Uh, simply because they didn't release that one on the Commodore uh, 64. <laughs> That's kind of always kind of bummed about that. Because that's not an issue anymore. No, no, no. That was always a problem. And again, yes, I remember this fr frustration. It's the same frustration for me about Eye of the Beholder 3. Um, I was expecting it to be such a great game, and it didn't work out, unfortunately. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, you know, you got a pretty good collection going here. Uh, do you have some games that you're getting more feedback about or people more drawn to some? I mean, what, what's kind of the, what's on the radar? What's what's popping? Um, I believe the most popular ones are obviously gold box games. Um, so generally, I think they split into two uh, sections. So one will be Eye of the Beholder games. Generally, the first and the second one, exactly as I was saying, third one doesn't have a yeah, huge... You like the third so much. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, about the third one that it just sucks generally. Is there what? What's the problem? Um, just boring, just boring, boring, boring. And there are many other issues there that I don't want to <laughs> advertise because let everyone experience it. Was this or not sand design? Try, try I'm trying, to to remember the, trying to remember the history of this. I don't know if this was was this a different team that came in to do the third one. Yes this thing as well from what again from what i remember uh again i i, I might have a mishmash in my head already uh and a, another let's see big batch of games that are being loved by gamers it's obviously um other gold box titles so Korean series is the third one on the interest list yes. and again, right now because I, i'm i'm a fan of this uh setting i'm i'm pushing spell jammer even though it's not the best game, but still, in terms of setting, Pushing it's... Yeah, this is another game I've, I've kind of been intrigued by, just because it is so different than the... You know, I mean, imagine coming from, like, Gold Box to... I have the okay. whole completely different. It's totally it's, different. Um, it's, um, again, and the setting is fantastic, because usually there are settings where you have either a future sci-fi thing or fantasy and i think that's one of a few that combine fantasy in the future yeah what do they call this environment it's not cyberpunk steam uh, it's not steam it's not steampunk steampunk is still Victor more, more victorian but steampunk. yes uh i want to say techno uh Techno fantasy, I think something like this. So <clears throat> you think it would be worth revisiting this since no, this one for sure. I highly recommend it. Okay. That's the one, that's the one I was checking <laughs> out recently. Yeah, I, it, I recall this one didn't do too well when it came out. I don't know if it was just 
a little too different maybe it was absolutely different so again people were not expecting such thing uh plus again at that time dnd is dnd so nobody would think about spell jammer and again i know that the uh, wizards are trying to uh relaunch uh this setting but i think it didn't work quite well for them still a lot of people who really love it i mean well, every now and then i get a comment from somebody who's like when are you going to cover that you know <laughs> you know so there's a lot of uh, of those other settings <clears throat> besides i think most people probably like if we're honest i mean forgotten realms it's just i mean it's just wonderful uh corinne you know margaret weiss tracy hickman i mean who doesn't like that uh you almost What's have to you go ahead no that's an interesting thing because uh the fact is that i think forgotten realms and dragon lands are almost on par in terms of popularity between uh, generally gamers and overall people interested in dnd uh, because for me i was okay there were so many games in forgotten realms so probably it's a leading one uh that's why we have all these Baldur's gates and other things uh, and it's a period no actually dragon lands is on par with it yeah, the only one I can yeah, you got Ravenloft here too is another one. It's like the Ravenloft, the Dark Sun. I think there's an Alcadem. You know, quite a few <laughs> other settings for people that are bored with the Forgotten Realms, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Al Alcadem is like uh, it's a unique one. Uh, and because it's so unique, again, not so many people are aware of it even. Not mention it, it's a different gameplay. Um, so it, it's not uh, RPG is such. It's interesting how all of those uh, D and D games they have uh, so different gameplay. Uh, if you just go through the whole collection, it's just they're not the same formula RPGs. They're different games, and I think it just shows how diverse um, the game design thought was back then, as it was booming, exploring. So I think it's it, it's a great way to just immerse yourself by playing to or looking to throw all these games uh, into the 90s and understand how we eventually came up to the genres and ideas we have today yeah i agree it's it's, it's really fascinating you know, especially with ssi and they they went for so long with that gold box engine and then after they were finished with that i guess you had the black box games from from westwood but then there was just like this explosion <laughs> and you could really see they were experimenting really trying to find like what would follow? No, they would. They had to find something new at the time, and probably this is like part of the failure. They were experimenting too much. Well, that was a, you know. They, I remember reading some of the magazine reviews of some of their later Gold Box games, and a lot of the cr critics would say, "Well, it's just the same old engine. You know, it's the same game with new." And I'm like, "Well, I could play those games happily till I die, but okay, you know." So you want to see? It's like they're being pressured. You you've got to change. You've got to do something different. You got to reinvigorate, you know, innovate. But uh, no, we'll see. I still have my own dream just to full uh, to fulfill my gold box dreams. We need to bring Buck Rogers games back to people one day. Oh yeah, and Buck after, Rogers. And after it, oh. I'm I'm personally done when it comes to gold well, box. Ne Never Winter Nights, the uh, online one. Uh, Never Winter Nights from 1991. This would be my dream, and you know that I'm. And that we're as close to making it come true. Sure, well, that's exciting. I've always wanted to play that, you know. And I, I, know, I realize you can download some stuff and sort of play a single player thing, but that kind of misses the point to me. I mean, you know, the fun would be having a whole bunch of people to play with, <laughs> like oh, it was America. back in the was it America Online? I think America Online at the time, and actually, the, the game still has a quite hardcore community talk to a few guys from it so who knows uh, if we are able to clear all the rights maybe we'll be able to do something together oh, yeah, i'd be on board with that i'll definitely want to try that maybe we could all play together that'd be pretty cool yeah this will be cool <laughs> uh, what is it with the buck rogers is just that hard to get a hold of the buck rogers uh that... there is a long story uh because again back to the time of tsr uh so um the daughter of the original kind of creator of Buck Rogers was on board. She was the CEO of the company. So she brought this IP. And when the company was going through different merges, acquisitions, bankruptcies, so the rights went together with her. 
and then they, they from what I remember they have a never-ending conflict uh with regards to creator uh of uh Buck Rogers and producers uh like and there are two families and they're in court for I don't know how many years so it's not clear till now uh, plus there were different tv series announced by one party then by another party um crossing my fingers that in a few years they will sort it out and there will be a chance you guys probably get a lot of requests for those games I imagine um well people are asking about them plus again I think that the best tool uh for people who want some old games to be back is actually to go to gog.com uh and uh vote on that fantastic wish list because trust me it's being used by GOG business development team and not only by them I can see the marketing for this right the countdown the countdown to countdown <laughs> to doomsday <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a good series I mean I remember a lot of good reviews of those games back in the day no one again it's the same engine as Goldbox I, I just remember one thing Oleg was talking about the history of Back Rogers uh I think it's important to underline when it comes to the classic games that is the challenge like to go from okay the company made a game in year 1992 and then it was merged acquired partially sold in terms of IPs to someone and you need to reconstruct all of this paperwork and it's pre-digital mostly it's all papers which were shredded lost burned or whatever and that's that's kind of usually the challenge before you even get to someone to talk about hey I want to release your game you, you need to identify who is that person you need to talk to so yeah yeah it's like, I mean I've talked to having a lot of those designers you know on the show and they're always one of it always surprises I mean they are just stunned that I even want to talk to them right they're like this is just some game I did 30 40 years ago I mean it sort of came and went you mean you mean people are still playing that thing I'm like how do you not know yeah it's a huge thing you know there's all this communities and people DOS box and they have no idea you know they just completely a lot of them have just left the games industry you know gone into uh, some kind of business programming or something so yeah it's I don't know maybe it's a I think people maybe maybe modern designers are a little more aware that games will be around longer <laughs> I think the perception changed across these years because again uh 20 years ago even 10 years ago okay maybe 15 15 20 years ago and further people were not thinking that games live more than two three years because that was the life cycle of the game you release it in retail you put it on the shelf uh then it's out of the shelves and the game is dead um because there was no other way to get it and I think with the digital distribution appearing in our life it changed but many people who never knew about the fact it exists they don't even think that you can re-release this product nowadays and then there is a following that there are certain fans of it yeah no there's still a lot of that perception I guess maybe amongst some people about well it's an old game the graphics suck you know because it's you know five years old I'm like I'm playing games that are 30 40 years old here pal <laughs> you know? I mean you get you get over it I want to show you guys a little something I, I put together here on a Twitter a little poll I did I thought you might be interested in this poll so I asked people uh do you get more excited about a new game coming out or a favorite old classic being re-released -re on GOG or Steam and if you look at that the old game you know it's it's close but more people are interested in the old game so i mean if i was in business games the games industry business i mean this is this would get my attention matt i think that's what is happening nowadays uh i think we're uh, entering the era where there will be huge boom of remasters remakes uh reimagined versions of different old titles because i think everybody's paying attention to it right now and again we are entering the era where IP means everything and many people realize wow uh, we had a great game the last one didn't work out what if we take an old game from 20 years ago from the same IP and relaunch it and again we have fantastic uh remasters proper remasters um like uh, Final Fantasy 7 um or Resident Evil they're doing great job here like I would say exceptional job 
So it will be cool to see where it all goes because again, there are so many great IPs, great uh, mechanics that uh, it would be cool to check out nowadays with modern yeah. graphics. I mean, like Dragon Strike comes to mind. I mean, imagine yeah. that game with like cutting edge. Dragon Strike, don't tell me this because reality, uh, virtual reality, you know, you could, I mean, it, it could be the most amazing thing ever. Dragon Strike is one of the, my biggest surprises because um, in my memory, I was playing it in 2D because I had I had NES version. Uh, and then I was shocked because actually all other versions apart from yeah, NES. So the NES version was two-dimensional. Wow. Yes. So they're all 3D. I was like, oh my God. I, I always thought, it, oh, it's a different game. And then now it's Dragon Strike. And I'm like, oh my gosh. All my kids' dreams now are destroyed. But Dragon Strike, I think Larian did a quite good job here. And I, and I need to ask Sven because he's a DD fan uh, whether Dragon Commander had some inspirations of <laughs> Dragon Strike. I believe he had some inspirations from it. Oh, you're right. Totally. Yeah. Dragon I just Command. realized it's quite close. I just, you know, World of Warcraft their latest uh expansion they brought in dragons you know you can ride dragons now like, that's an old idea folks <laughs> no 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 but again if you check dragon commander i just oh, wonder dragon because commander. now now i start uh, wondering is there any moment when you're flying on the dragon well, they should Not familiar with yes them. also i like remember this game called eye of the dragon yes 2005 it also about riding a dragon uh but i think it has more strategic take so you never know which game influence whom and why and i think it's important we don't forget don't lose those classics and just have them around yeah it's it's a hard thing to know who i mean it's not that hard of an idea to come up with right if, let's put people on dragons <laughs> it's like Who's it, Anne uh, McCaffrey, I think is her name, way back, like Dragons of Perth, I think. I don't know if you ever read her stuff. And then, I mean, it, came, it, it all comes from books originally, right? The yes. Dragon, Dragonlance. And I'm pretty sure it's like Anne McCaffrey. I'm going to get yelled at in the comments. <laughs> somebody will remember. Yeah, somebody will definitely remember. Well, let's see what else I want to talk to you guys about i noticed that oh uh i was going to ask you since you had mentioned uh uh douglas winston douglas wood if you're if you're thinking about maybe that fantasy not final fantasy but the p-h-a-n <laughs> fantasy um actually because this was an, an inspiration for me why because i was trying to understand who owns the rights for this um, ip because i have a feeling that doug might own all or maybe part of the rights yeah uh, and, and if he doesn't own all of them i think that we have the remaining part so um hopefully We're fantasy snag fantasy soon um again we just need to check it out uh because again this is exactly the year where uh not so uh much agreements were saved and when we were digging into different ssi uh topics and different products that we've acquired the rights for. For some of them, there were agreements, but for some of them, there are none. And you don't know whether these rights actually were sold, transferred to someone, or actually they stayed within the company. Just nobody thought about mentioning them because usually five years after the launch, nobody cared about them. Well, that was a pretty popular series. I mean, I know people that prefer those games to the gold box games, even, you know, they were playing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, you, I know people. I'm not, <laughs> you, know, they, you, you, you kind of fall in whatever the first CRPG is that you really just fall in love with, you know, uh, that's going to set a certain standard for you. Uh, and, you know, there's certain things in that series, too, like the little dances that your party does when they win a battle. You know, I've seen that in later games. So I think it was influential. Plus, I mean, it's such a great developer. He's, he's you know, as you saw in the interview, great guy to talk to. No, no, he's a fantastic person. And again, uh, just need to check a few things and we'll we'll get back in touch with him. And I might I need to ask you for an introduction, by the way. Hmm? <laughs> Me? He might I, be faster. I, yeah, I forget how I got 
in touch. I think we have a lot of the same problems, you know, trying to find people and and contact them. But I, I don't. I, I seem like with him, I don't remember how I contact. Sometimes I just do this thing on Twitter where I'm like, "Does anybody know this?" No, no, no. Yes, and usually somebody will reply. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's like you ask, "Hey, does anyone know guys from Snag?" And I see that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was like, "Where are you guys?" I kept looking for. Like, why don't you guys have? Do you have a website that I'm just not finding? No, no there is no. What what's the deal? You just anti website. Have time for it. It's just <laughs> like you either work on the game X or you work on the website. And like I don't need websites to do the work or talk to people. So at some point we're gonna have it, sure. But it doesn't really limit our ability to I'll sign just partners, talk to friends. Chat, just go to Chat GPT and say, make me a website. I think that's how it works. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, no, that's 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 a scary part. That's a scary part. Uh, mentally, I'm not ready for it. It's great, but mentally, I, I'm scared of it. About the whole open AI and chatbots and all that. Mm -hmm. No, and I want people to still do job. Is it cool to check what exactly you are achieving? What your thoughts are? Whether you think in the right direction, or if you need a bit of help, that's fine. But when somebody starts doing everything, everything for you uh that's this the is trajectory look i mean we, we look at the history right when i was a kid when we we're playing these gold box games you had to sit down and read a manual my god you know had to like yes. all the time like learn how to play the game okay then we move from that to it's you don't need to read a manual you know it's we'll, we'll sort of baby step you through you know it's, there's nothing here to really challenge you so that was bad enough and now we're like we'll just think for you <laughs> you don't even have to and think now and now we have a pointer on the map which says the quest goes there. You know, I've got this is a it just amazes me. Like people uh, would say, I'd rather sit and watch you play a game than uh, play this, the this game is myself. I mean, like what? <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, what's up with that? No, that's again. I think it changed for me because at a certain point, I also started watching streams a lot. Especially when you're traveling, and uh, again, my, my console for many, many years was Switch. Uh, for one reason, I was traveling with it everywhere. You can play it on the plane, but right now with Steam Deck, I'm extremely grateful to all these fantastic people because finally I can play almost everything I want, almost everything uh, on the plane, on the train, in the car, doesn't matter where. Uh, but again, it's not supporting those blocks for now, but hopefully one day. I know you guys have talked about developing some of these games uh, or making console versions of some of them. Yeah. Yes, no, no, Valve guys are fantastic in this. And again, yes, it's niche. Yes, it's for hardcore gamers, but it's fantastic. I'll have to check it. I don't have one. Do you think I should get one? Yeah, if totally. It... If you travel, uh, yes, it's a must-have in my opinion. Uh, again, See, I, I'm, I, I'm, never, I never leave the basement. So, <laughs> uh, if you want to move you, uh, from a chair to a couch, you should have this one. Oh, looks cool. And you connect it to the to TV, and again, keep on playing. So it's also good. Well, we should probably uh, wrap up here. I know you guys. There's one thing I left I was going to ask you about, and I know I've read some of the other interviews you've done, uh, and people were asking you if you wanted to do your own game, or is doing all this work sort of inspired you to do your own project? And it seems like you guys are kind of hinting, yes, <laughs> you know, we got something kind of on the back burner. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Is it, is it somewhat solid at this point, or is it still very kind of just, you know, maybe one of these days we'll do this thing? and um i think that's obviously a dream but i think again i can say for myself uh, because this is usually how we work with our team each of us shares our own dreams um and goals and then we try to align here i would love to have um, and develop our own title one day uh, but um there are so many game mechanics that i would love to use uh or there are so many universes that i would love to add on top that it will be always a hard choice uh, and i think that as of today we didn't find that one uh that we want to develop exactly 
um, and uh, I have a feeling that within the next two years max it will crystallize I also think that you need to be a game designer at heart and have a will and energy to do that and neither of me or all like our game designers right? uh, so I think for now we're going to stick to do what we know how to do revive, resurrect bring back to life um and the interesting thing that the more the games of the past appear in the public space the more people talk about it the more interest it gathers so i think the closest thing you're going to see from us is likely that we would enable other people to mm -hmm. do something about those games or those universes before we would make anything on our own so i think that's more realistic answer <laughs> Yeah, I think I like the idea you were talking about before of taking like there's a lot of fun and and remaking something, especially if you if it's one of your favorite personal favorite games, you know, and you really want to bring it to that next level. I mean, to me, uh, I think that would be very rewarding. <laughs> Maybe you're not designing something totally new, but I mean, you get to follow in the footsteps of the, you know, the the guy or gal that made this thing that you loved back in the day. No, I agree with you. So there are quite a few worlds and universes that I would love to play with myself. Um, we'll not be touching D&D for now. Yeah, I was wondering, like, do you want to do, would you like to be on like that Baldur's Gate 3 crew or would you want to do something a little less uh, less well-known? Like, what is it? Did Blade of Darkness ever get a sequel? <laughs> I personally hope so. I would love someone to to make a sequel. And if uh, at some point uh, uh, a team would appear and say, we want to make a sequel, we're like, please do. No, yes, I think we're, we're open, especially when it comes to certain IPs that we fully acquired the rights for. We're happy for people to do oh. yeah. like I have the Beholder 4. <sighs> no, I have the Beholder is more complicated because we don't own the IP, so it's still with Wizards of the Coast. We just own the rights for the code. That's it. Uh, we could work out the details later. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Bill, yeah, question to you. Under the gate. Uh, question to you, Matt. Uh, any your personal wish list for the classics? Anything you're like? Oh, I wish this could have been released. You know, the Buck Rogers ones are right up there for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I often That's hear on the, list. the fantasy series. I love to see those. Those come up. You guys have done a lot of the, a lot of my personal favorites. You guys have already done. I'd have to think Is more it... about sort of more obscure stuff, perhaps. Because it's always interesting because uh, everyone has their own sort of golden age of gaming, and they have own years. Uh, and we're always like on the lookout. We're always asking like, what is important to you? What moved you when you were? when you started playing games so uh yeah if you'll remember something let us know yeah my first one first one i ever played was sword of fargo you remember that that's Ooh. <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a very old one yeah that was a lot of fun then i went from there to bard's tale and then i guess to I guess different from that to gold box. You know, there's certainly a few more. There's certain ones I play on the Amiga that have always kind of intrigued me. Uh, you know, one game that I get a lot of requests to do is called uh, Black Crypt. Black Crypt. Yeah, that's an Amiga game. Apparently, if you've played it, you think it's the best thing ever. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of those sort of uh, 90s era. I guess they only came out on like the ST or the Amiga computer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of people don't don't even know they exist, but there's some pretty interesting, interesting. I'm sure if I thought more about it, I'd probably come up with 50 titles for you. <laughs> You're free to share them anytime. I'm like, already free. looking it up. Released in 1992 by you guys are gonna, we're going to get flooded with comments on this video. Oh, you this and um, yeah, you didn't even mention uh, hired guns, you know. I just did. Hired guns. That's for saying that. Yes, that's a good one. Man, can you imagine a hired guns remake where you could play that online with people? 
that, that was a dream for many 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 years actually uh because again jagged aliens was kind of similar to it mm-hmm. and i know quite a few companies were trying to do it did it work out no so far no i'm trying to think too there was that this one that was popular on the uh, they did a cd32 version of it can't think of the name of that one i want to say sentinel but that doesn't sound right but anyway we're gonna i'm sure we'll get lots of fun comments from people <laughs> hey but anyway guys uh, thanks for taking the time thanks uh, a lot for your time man so much appreciated you, uh, you wanted to promote or that we didn't talk about or anything promoting we believe that let the games promote themselves uh, if if community likes something that's great if somebody from your community will be willing to ask something or ask or request a game happy to jump on comments and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make a few more dreams come true yeah for sure we're going to be checking out the comments so if you're watching this and like oh please look at this particular game let us know we'll have a look for sure you guys ever heard of a game called alien fires i heard the name but i don't uh, have any see, pictures in my mind like the only guy in the world that likes this game know this one <laughs> that's weird <laughs> you know i wrote about it in dungeons and desktops and i got some feedback it's like a couple guys that uh you ever talk to crpg addict familiar nope. with this side you might want to check out his blog he plays through he play all the way through these classic CRPGs and he blogs about it and posts screenshots and things. But uh, I think he was uh, kind of following some of the advice I would give in this book about games that I liked. And he just hated. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> you know, Barton, I think, fell off the cliff with this game. I mean, this is terrible. No, I'm looking at the screenshots of Alien Fires. No, I never played it. I've never heard about it. But maybe it's me. Yeah, that one. There's one called Fairy Tale Adventure. Might be a little. You ever heard of that one? Yeah, there's lots of these well, games that just nobody's heard of. I think Fairy Tale Adventure is probably a better game, but it's just it's kind of hard sometimes. I think when you played something as a kid and haven't looked at it since you were a kid, you know, you, you kind of get this inflated sense of oh, it was so great. <laughs> you go back and play it today, and you're like, oh, oh man. my god. <laughs> But you know th- that's another thing when you uh, when you're about to release a game or you're working in a game which you didn't play back in the days. So it's a new thing for you, and it's mm-hmm. old game. So you have to really digest all the details about the game and understand why it was so special to people, so you don't break things for them. So yeah. as you know, you threw a bunch of examples for us, like we didn't play the game, so we don't know them. And when it happens that we're about to release something like that, it's a lot of work for us to like, okay, we need to know what we're talking about. We have to. You guys don't want to. You guys don't want to. Do and respect. Don't do alien fires. Uh. <laughs> yeah, this, this is looking at this oh, wish list here. You need a new wish list. Freelancers on. Love. You telling me freelancers not already on GOG? It's not. Nope. It's, stuck with, it's, stuck with, it's stuck with Microsoft, so yes. Go oh. into the game section and filter it by the most popular ever. Yeah, I see Doom 4 is at the top of the list. No, it's just like this week thing. So if you, again, if you go to games... Is there a way to see like the... No, no, no. You need to go to the top uh, tab, uh, games. Yeah. Uh-huh. I still remember. And then on the left, on the left. Just order by... Uh, on the left, left, yeah, order by ever. So, yeah, Diablo, and good luck, good luck with that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, that's, that's a good series. Is it a Battletech? You know, that's another one that I, I had butted head with an RPG yeah. addict that Battletech Crescent Hawk. Oh, that's a great, a great series overall. Generally, Battletech is fantastic, but yeah, here. I love you- you need to get to convince Microsoft to give it away at least for a while. Well, maybe they lost enough money over this Activision thing. So Did far, they lose they much. Gobble, they wanted to gobble. Apparently, Activision wanted to be gobbled up. Come take this away, Microsoft. Command and Conquer. Have some part. Yes, yeah, System Shock too. Well, these guys are working on that Night Dive, right? 
Oh, it's completed already, so it means it's delivered. So all is good. Oh yeah, no, I think you guys are working on no one lives forever, right? Is that? Oh, Oleg, do you want to take a uh, stage with this? It's just my dream. Uh, that's it for now. <laughs> no, no, no other comments. Well, that would be a great one. Yeah, those are. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure vampire. Yeah, it's completed. Okay, yeah, vampire. Yeah, yes. Uh, Final Fantasy. Yeah, this is a great resource. I bet. Yeah, Discworld. That was just two days ago. Somebody wishing for that. No, just like the last vote is from the uh, last two. Oh, last days. vote. Why don't you just do all of these games, guys? Come on. <laughs> exactly. One day, one day it will be all in life. Hopefully, maybe one day you just go to Chat GPT. Yeah, just uh, make all these games again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, let's hope for a better future. But we'll see. Well, I got a good feeling you guys are good. You're going to be in business for a long time because I don't think this demand is going to go away anytime soon. You know, if anything, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And... I think there will be more people who have this nostalgic feeling. And again, I think that's one of the things that everybody... It's an, an, an eternal thing, uh, nostalgia. We're all getting back to it. Hopefully, you know, even beyond that, I think we're getting to a point kind of like where we did with music or movies, you know, where it's like it's not only is it nostalgia, but we just recognize that there's certain masterpiece things that were made that stand the test of time. And this could be 50 years from now, people will be playing this game. And it's like with certain songs on the radio, right? You're never it's not like the Beatles are obsolete. <laughs> oh, yeah, those guys are obsolete now. You know, you're never going to have. You know, it just amazes me we had to kind of go through that period where people thought that. Um, but anyway, thanks to you guys, you're, you're back in the game. <laughs> um, I mean, Citizen Kane doesn't need to be in 3D and 4K, right? It's just oh, yeah, a thing on. of its own, of its era, <laughs> and it's great on its own. Same with gaming. Some games from the 90s just need to say they are, and we should just remain to have access to them. Well, that's an interesting example that you give Citizen Kane, because I know a lot of film, you know, I work with some film history professors, you know, and I remember they, they would talk about how if you want to piss them off, you know, start talking about color colorizations, colorized movies. Or, Oof. Oh, Oof. How dare you? <laughs> no, Here the light is not obsolete. You know, it's beautiful. You know, it is it's, its own art form, right? You know, I hope we, I think we're kind of getting that way with at least old games now. You know, you do hear more people interested in the 8-bit, that aesthetic, the pixel look. It's not just people having this knee-jerk reaction anymore. And it's like, that sucks. You know, that's <laughs> look at those 8-bit graphics. I think we're getting a little more mature now uh, where people can look at those games and, and say, you know, this was really beautiful art. You know, we don't need to update this. And, doesn't and, need to yeah, go ahead. And all the imperfections they are just making it more interesting the all the technical limitations they are making it unique and look at the all the classic shooters so-called boomer shooters they're trying to replicate the certain aesthetic which was present back in the day so it, it tells you that it has a certain cultural appeal which just stands the test of time and it does needs to be changed and we can reuse it in the future for for different art forms or the same art form with just new ways of approaching that. So yes, absolutely, the the classics they can coexist with the new stuff. It can get remade. It can stand on its own in the original form. And I think games industry reaching a point already reached a point where it's mature enough uh, to showcase it, uh, same as the movies. I mean, we didn't invent remasters. Movies are doing remastering remakes all the time. Uh, for for the films for the already fifty years, so um, nothing new in this room. Citizen Kane, re the remake. Uh, no, no, thanks. Um, you know, one one last thought, I guess. Here, uh, I was talking about this similar issues with a friend yesterday, and he, I don't know if he came up with this term or not, but I thought it was cool. He, he called it our our vinyl moment, the vinyl moment. And like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, didn't you know that like in the music world, there's more interest these days in like records. Like the old phone vinyls, yes. Like, like that's the hot thing, you know. If you're if you're a cool dude, you know you you have to get the music on on a record, 
<laughs> he's like what about games you know has, has games do we have a, the vinyl moment <laughs> where the old you know the old is cooler than the new you know i don't know if what do you think i would say the collector's editions the retail boxes they will never go away they will always be with us there will always be a demand and i think this is the closest equivalent we have for vinyl it's because it has a physical form, it has a certain smell to it, certain items which are packed there. Um, so yeah, I think it's never going to be obsolete and it will be always present. Yeah, exactly. Oh, what was that? Uh, was it Star What? No, no. <laughs> but there is smell, that's true. No, no, I think that's... Um, I, I agree with Artem here. But these great boxes we had in the past um proper box copies uh, of the games uh, they will get back yes we'll not be producing hundreds of thousands of those but a few thousand would yes. always sell uh, for those people who are interested in it and um, guys like limited run or others i think that's what they're doing nowadays um and there will be different reworks re-released versions um just a matter of time i think it's uh yes you see artem you have it Oh, that's like a pretty good, pretty good condition too. That oh, yeah, yeah, it's all nice and like opens and has the original. I mean, come on, it's did you get to have something like that if you like a game? Yeah, I wish did we you had get smell vision because I bet it has that that smell that we keep talking about. It's you can't really describe it, but no. And again, my collection is growing, so I'm just wondering when my wife will tell me get out of here. <clears throat> Well, you know, some people credit me with starting that trend on YouTube, having the, I don't have it up here for this, but you know that I, I like to record behind, in front of a bookshelf, mm -hmm. the game boxes showing and, you know, people, uh, I think, well, people get tired of looking at me, so they'll look back there and, oh yeah, look, he's got, you know. <laughs> this game and this game and this game and this, wow, and that game as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then they can't help themselves, right? They got to go to eBay, you know, and start trying to find those uh, used copies of those games and sometimes that could be. It really no. is becoming a collectible collector's item. I mean, who would have thought? There are. And trust me, I really, I was discussing business idea with a few friends of mine, I think one year ago, prior to COVID, that earlier or later, there will be an auction house that will be sending this original sealed versions of the games uh, that were, I don't know, limited editions or something, uh, something with bugs um, or mistakes and prints. So it will appear. Just give it a bit of time. All the original bugs. I got the one with the bugs. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I guess you guys probably you said that you're thinking about this as a business proposition. That's kind of interesting. I don't know too many. I've seen a few of those efforts to like redo a game or bring back a game and even have the box and the printed manuals and things. Is that something you're looking into at some point? Yes. But again, it's a matter of time. That that's the thing because like compiling all these things it's a separate. It's it will require probably two or three more guys on the team to support us in this. Maybe one day. Box editions, it's a um, significant undertaking if you want to do it right. Not just like hey, here's some edition which you release, but if you really want to do justice to the particularly old games, that's quite a task. So yes, in general, let's see how it's gonna go. It comes in the nearest future. Hopefully, it will work out again. Nostalgia forever. <laughs> of course, it will. We'll have our vinyl moment. You guys will be right on top of that vinyl moment wave. Just <laughs> let's wait for it. It should appear. Yeah, wait for it. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for doing this. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully get this video posted soon and we can all uh look at the comments and see what <laughs> see, what, see what crawls out of the woodwork that should be interesting anyway you guys have a good one thanks yeah. Matt. take care get a website yeah. <laughs>
Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very much for keeping this show on the air. Could not and would not do it without you, folks, so thank you. <laughs> you know, it's uh, kind of aggravating lately. Uh, you know, I want to do these shows on a more frequently. You know, I like I love to go back to a weekly, you know, Matt chat, but uh, the threshold for doing that on the Patreon is like so, it's like so tantalizingly close at this point. It's just like, <laughs> I'm just going to ask you guys, <laughs> you know, just step up, I mean, like, you know, a few more bucks and we'll be there. You know, if everybody that watches the show is a fan of the show, uh, we'll kick in a little bit. You know, a buck a show is all I ask. If you can afford more than that, though, you know, that'd be great. Uh, or if you're watching this show and you're like, I'm going to donate one day, <laughs> you know, one of these days, uh, you'll make it today because it'll really make a big difference. Like I said, just so close, you know, just a few more people and we'll be there. And then I can forget about having to worry about marketing this thing and focus on what I really like to do, which is finding people to interview <laughs> and doing uh, the game reviews and, you know, the fun stuff. The stuff you guys actually like. Uh, you don't want me spending my time marketing. You know, you know, so uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, contributed. I have a new uh, patron, Ratron as I like to call him, named Adam. Uh, so thank you, Adam. Uh, so if you, you could be as cool as Adam too, though. Let's go, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. A couple of minutes. It's cheap. It's easy. You'll like this show better. You'll be part of the team. Uh, you'll be on the Discord. I mean, come on, come on. You know you want to. All right. Uh, <laughs> what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, Tire Gaming Dad writes in about Stasis Bone Totem. Now, you know I had these guys on the show, fabulous team, uh, fabulous uh, uh, dev team. Well, they're almost ready to release their game. They've got over 50 full motion videos in the can. Full motion video. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you had me at full motion video. I love full motion. It's good. It's good stuff. What happened to full motion video? Bring it back. I still got my 3D over there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're bringing that. Uh, they got those in the can. They're also thoroughly testing every scene. Uh, and then, you know, that could take a lot of work. I always feel like uh, you know, people have so so little appreciation for QA, you know, for uh, bug finders, you know, and, and, and beta testing and all that sort of thing. You know, if it's got bugs, everybody complains about it. Uh, if it doesn't have bugs, you know, they don't come out praising the beta testers. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, I really appreciate these guys doing this work. I know it's not fun, uh, but it is important. It'll make for a better gameplay experience. All right, and then Richard Simmons writes in. Oh, yeah, Richard. Uh, Atari. Yes, Atari has acquired hundreds of PC and console titles. Uh, this collection includes notable games from Bubsy... <laughs> Hardball, okay. Demolition Racer series, as well as a bunch of uh, uh, old flight simulator games. These are coming from Accolade, Infogrames, and Micro Pros. Now, I don't have the list. I don't think anybody has the list yet, at least as far as I have. If you have it, share it. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't able to find a comprehensive list, uh, so we just have these examples. I don't know if these are like the best ones from this collection or, or what. what's going on here. Uh, but I hope they have more because they're planning to. This is according to the CEO here, Wade Rosen. Uh, they're planning to re-release these games in a physical, as well as digital formats, in some case even port them uh, to modern consoles. Uh, so that really caught my eye. I mean, we've been talking about this off and on on Twitter, like how much we miss the games and the boxes. You know, so if these guys, that's what they're talking about. You know, this truly is exciting. I love to see some of these uh, old games, as well as, you know, updates and all that uh, re-released. And <laughs> something I could put on the shelf, yay! All right, then uh, along with the Atari news, just mention, if you remember the Atari XL and XE uh, computing platform, well, if you got one of those sitting around, you might want to dig it out of storage or dust it off or <laughs> maybe play with it every day. I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, there's a new game out for this thing. It's called Scorch. Uh, and this is a, they call it a clone here. This is an indie retro news. A clone of Scorched Earth. Uh, I think that was on DOS. And Scorch Tanks, which is the one I, I liked. <laughs> I liked them both, but, you know, Scorch Tanks is probably my favorite. I played that on my uh, Amiga computer to death. It's a, it's a, what they call a turn-based artillery duel type of game. Artillery, you know, you, you're like, what's the angle? What's the power? You know, and it's, I did a little research on this. I did a video on it way, way back. Um, these, are, these artillery games, I mean, they go back all the way to the dawn of uh, personal computers and consoles. But before that... 
Now these, the fun thing about this is these were actually not games. You know, they, these were like old computer programs that were literally being used to, for artillery. Like, you know, calculating the trajectories of these uh, uh, ballista, you know, the <laughs> artillery. <laughs> you know, these heavy projectiles, these shells, I suppose they're called. Uh, so it's kind of fun. I guess the, you know, starts off being like this deadly serious thing. But uh, these programmers must have felt like, you know, this could be a fun game idea. You know? So they started printing these things in magazines, you could type it in. Uh, then there was artillery duel, a whole bunch of other things. So basically, there's a lot of history uh, to this genre, and I just always think it's kind of fascinating when something that's not really a game at all, you know, the opposite of a game, but becomes a game, and you know, we're still playing it like all this time later. It's amazing. Uh, so anyway, check that out for sure. That's Scorch. And then uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. Now I was looking for quotes as I want to do. I found this. I thought it was really appropriate uh, for the content of this episode <laughs> it goes something like this young love is a flame very pretty often very hot and fierce but still only light and flickering the love of the older and disciplined heart is as coals deep burning unquenchable that's how I feel about the gold box games. <laughs> anyway, that's a quote there from uh, Henry Ward Beecher. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next time. I'm a wizard, mind you!